Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. This is the Inspector USB and I'm testing it out. I just got this little guy a little while ago. It's absolutely wonderful, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, show you some of its interesting little features, and you'll see it on subsequent videos in the future because this is now my new toy to play with. This is just like the other inspectors, for example this Inspector EXP Plus, except in this unit you have a detached wand with the uh, detector on it. This unit has the actual detector on the bottom of it, as you can see. Now, most of the Inspector series have the actual detector on the bottom, so that's not actually new. I just wanted to show you the difference between that and contrast with the EXP. This uses the same detector as all of the other inspectors, the LND 7317 pancake tube. Very sensitive. It's one of the most sensitive Geiger counters I know of. It's not the most, it's one of the most. Uh, definitely one of the most sensitive of normal Geiger counters that you find, you know, run of the mill without having to special order or specially get. This unit is uh, fundamentally different from the other ones in so much as that it has a USB feature, meaning it literally has a USB jack on the side of it if you can see that. This USB jack plugs into any computer and allows you to use their software, the Observer software, to actually download data that you've recorded. You can notice this is recording at the bottom. It is data logging right this moment. And it'll record um, anywhere from about a thousand minutes to several days worth of data depending on what you set it to. You can set the recording interval times. You can say record once every 10 minutes if you like, once every hour, and technically you could stretch that out for a really long time depending on how much, uh, how, how imprecise you want that to be. So, uh, <clears throat> this is the unit right here. It's decently heavy because it has the detector built in. It uses a 9 volt battery which you can just pop this right open and there's a 9 volt battery. I shoved a piece of uh, paper in here because I found that my 9 volt wiggled a little bit and I found that putting the paper in there made it not wiggle as much. Um, that's just me. It wasn't really a problem. It just I'm very finicky about things. Uh, I have the audio on and you can hear it produces the beautiful clicking sound as opposed to the beep. Now I love my Ludlums and stuff and I love the beeps they make but at the same time I sort of like the click. So we'll cut that click off for a second though just so I can talk a little more easily. Currently we're setting counts per minute. We can also set to miller Rankins per hour. We can adjust this and let me show you how to do it. Shut it off while depressing the plus button. Turn it on. We'll let it go through its little cycle. Hold that down and once it's ready it'll say done. Using the plus and minus arrow keys you can move through the various features that it has which now says as opposed to before where it used to be just a number. And we go to units. Now we press the set button which means go in there and modify that and it'll say set. And You can use the plus and minus to switch between counts per minute miller Rankins per hour or counts per second microsieverts per hour. So we'll set and hold the button down and it says done and we hold it down one more time and it will actually start, oops get out of that. And it'll actually start us into the, um, get out of that. There we go. It'll start us into the actual mode so we can see. And I'll explain what this is. I just activated the alarm so I'll tell you what that is in just a second. So now we're in microsieverts per hour or counts per second. You'll notice that it shows fractional counts per second. For example 0 0.66 counts per second versus the old inspector which only had integer values like 1 or 2 or 3. If you put it in something radioactive enough you could get that a little bit higher maybe. We'll see if this can get up above one count per second. But as we know, this unit here, oops, this unit here actually can. So here, let me put a cobalt 60 source on top of it. That should, that should do it. Now that beeping sound that you're hearing is the alarm. We'll hit this button and cut it off. It has an alarm you can set. You can say, okay, when you go over however many counts per second, counts per minute, miller rankins per hour, micro per hour, whatever you want, when you go over that threshold, I want you to alarm, which is useful. I take this to work with me every day in my bag, and I set it to about 120 counts per minute, or if you like, two counts per second as my alarm. And if I go by something radioactive, it'll tell me. So, very useful. Let's notice we're at 41 counts per second. This should be actually a little higher because it's more directly on it, I guess. I don't know. Close enough. So, let's move this out of the way. Let's move the inspector out of the way and go over a few more things. You may have noticed already it has one interesting feature and that is a backlight. That is useful. There's a plus right here that you click when you're not in menu mode that'll actually activate that, that, that light. Now, while it seems that that's the most useful thing, wait, there's more. It can do some more interesting stuff. We shut it off. 
hold the plus, cut it back on, and let me show what it can do. This is the neat thing it does, the really neat thing it does. When in the menu, if you were to switch, let's go to um, use. Now what does use do? This is the most interesting thing of the whole unit. Press the set to go into use and use in plus and minus to move through it. Now let me show what it can do. It has pre-programmed efficiencies, meaning, uh, uh, well I'll explain what efficiencies are, for different nucleides. Do you remember how I always say you can't take a Geiger counter like this, put it in, in an energy unit like microsieverts power and hold it up against something like cobalt 60 because it's not calibrated. When it gets uh, uh, 100, for example, counts of cobalt 60, that's not the same dose rate as 100 counts of cesium-137, so it's always going to be wrong because it's always calibrated. They're almost always calibrated for cesium-137. Technically, there are other calibrations that exist, but most are for cesium-137. This one actually has the ability to switch between calibrations on the fly. So let me show you what it has for calibrations. Let me go back to the beginning. It has, um, some of these are, that might seem a little odd to you because they're used in the medical field. Um, I'll show you what they are here. There's uh, sulfur 35, strontium 90, yttrium 90, and they didn't put it down, but zircon 90, but zircon 90 doesn't actually emit anything, so I guess that's why. Uh, next on the list is cesium 137, then phosphorus 32. Oops, go back. Sensitive button. Uh, Carbon-14, this is naturally occurring. It um, exists in our atmosphere from uh, cosmogenic, uh, re, uh, 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 well, it's created in the atmosphere. It's created by cosmic rays hitting um, particles in the air and causing spallation. So let's keep going. Oops, I hit the done button. Oops, let's go back and go back into it again. It thought I was done, so let's get back in there. All right, there we go. All right, phosphorus 30, here we go. It's hard to do this one-handed. I should do it two-handed. Iodine-131. This is the stuff that comes out right after a nuclear blast. So you have a nuclear um, explosion. You have a uh, nuclear meltdown. Switch to that. <laughs> Very useful for the first few days. After that, it has cobalt-60. And then alpha. Now, I asked him what alpha meant. And alpha basically meant that it was a um, kind of a general alpha particle that they decided to use. The reality is, is that there are hundreds of different alphas that come out of different uh, alpha emitters. Like for example, this piece of granite's emitting two or three different types, if not many more, of uh, uh, alpha particles. When I say different types, I mean they're the same alpha particle, but they have a different energy. So I asked them what particular energy they used, and it turns out that they use thorium-230, which is a member of the uranium-238 decay chain. So I thought that was kind of funny that they ended up using that particular one. Now these are actually user configurable efficiencies, and I'll show you how to actually do that in just a minute. So let's switch to uh, one of them that we want to use. We're going to pretend that we have bumped into a nuclear scenario and there is potentially iodine-131 in the air. So we switch to iodine-131, click the set button that says done, click it again, that starts everything up. Here we are looking at becquerels. How many becquerels, which are decay per second, of iodine-131 are they? Well, obviously there are not actually any becquerels or any decays per second of iodine-131 around me, but it's saying that, look, I don't know what I'm actually reading. I'm not a gamma spectrometer, but if the counts that I'm getting are from uh, iodine-131, this is what the activity would be. It, that's all it's saying. It's not saying there is any, because it can't actually detect or identify isotopes, or rather nucleides. See, now you got me saying isotopes, and it should be nucleides. But it can tell you that if that were the scenario, if, if that hypothesis were correct, this is what you'd see. So you go and you take an air filter or something, and you take that air filter and you draw, let's say, 10 cubic yards of air through it, put it down, let's say 10 cubic meters and put it down, put this on top of it, boom, you have 27, well, 30 becquerels, you could divide that by 10 and know that you think that you have about 3 becquerels per cubic uh, meter of air. So you could do simple math like that. The geometry, by the way, is approximately a half a centimeter away from this and the exact shape of this. So that's exactly the testing shape that provides this calculation to be correct. If you use half of this, then you'd want to divide by two and so on and so forth. So you have to do a little bit of math if you want to get this exactly right. It's complicated stuff. I mean, you know, making nuclear physics handheld is sort of like really, really complicated. Now. Um, let's get out of this for a second and I'll show you something even neater and then we're going to log on to it and use the actual software and then that should be that. Now, let me go back, go back, go back, go back. By the way, it has a clock 
averaging, periods, efficiency, calibration, data logging, you name it. Very useful little tool. Worth the money, in my opinion, but that's just me. Okay, so here's this. You can buy for it, if you get it, the, um, in the uh, uh, Extreme Boot is what it's called. This is the Extreme Boot. It's a piece of rubber, basically. Um, this Civil Defense logo does not come with it. I stick that on my own stuff, so tough nuggets. But it's very easy to stick in. Let's click the Done button. Oop, go back. Done. All right, good. So now we're back into normal mode. We're in counts per second. Uh, we stick that in here and just kind of flop it right into place. There it is. It's the extreme boot, pops right open, locks into place, and I recommend this big time. It's very, very wonderful. It allows you to set the unit upright. The unit will stand reasonably well. It kind of pendulums back and forth. I always feel, you know, scared to let my unit fall, but this thing is a lifesaver for bumps and wear and tear and so on. And you can detect gamma like this, pop this open, detect alpha without the slightest bit of problem. It recesses the detectors. You don't have to worry about liquid spills and stuff being a problem. Um, even if you have older units like um, this Rattler 100, or actually it's the CRM 100, see, Civil Defense, you can take, you can buy another one of these uh, units and stick it right on here. Not only does it protect your Rat Alert or in any of the inspectors or CRMs or any of those sorts of units, but it also makes them look cooler too. And quite frankly, we can all agree or disagree if we want, but looking cool is also neat. So, there it is. Beautiful unit. Notice it's showing fractional counts per, st per second as opposed to just regular integer ones like the old inspectors did. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take uh, this guy right here and we're going to show you uh, an example of how you could actually use this in the home laboratory if you like. Um, I'm going to take a barium 137M generator, which I have that generates a um, small amount of uh, the nuclei barium 137M. And it's radioactive, but it's only radioactive for a few minutes. After 30 minutes, it's safe. So I'm going to show you how we can use this to hypothetically see whether or not we have leaked barium-137 on the ground. And we'll also check this on the computer and see what that looks like. So, uh, yeah, let's go do All that. Right. So you're performing an experiment with a barium-137M generator. You've created a small little container here of barium-137M for whatever your test is. And you pick up the generator, but you realize, oh, no. The generators bled a little bit onto the onto the ground. What could this be? Is it radioactive? Well, first off, don't touch it with your glove, obviously. Um, so we can take off our glove, and we can take the inspector here and actually hold this over and see. And sure enough, this little bit right here is radioactive. We can also get some idea of its activity. and then come back to it later on and see if it's cleaned itself up. So we'll give this about 30 minutes to decay, and we'll come back and see whether or not the area is now safe. All right, now we can see here we're, we are actually in the Observer software, and I'm plugged, I've plugged my inspector up to this software, and as you can see, it's doing its little counts per minute thing right here. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Geiger graph. Um, it shows you in counts per second, although you can set it to any unit that you want to. In fact, we can use set it as we wish to counts per minute or whatnot. And it's showing me the values here, what the counts are in counts per second, value two. We can adjust all of that, set alarms and everything, whatever we wish. Let's go up here and see some of the actual uh, interesting features it has. Number one, pre preferences. We can set, set the actual values one and two right here to whatever we want. So we can do counts per minute, counts per second, or anything you like. Um, you can actually save the grid automatically, do whatever you like here, your cleared memory and so on, set alarms, very useful stuff. And this is the neat thing. Let me show you the neat thing, Cal panel. Click on Cal panel. This allows you to basically uh, program your inspector right from here. For starters, I can change that alarm feature I was telling you about to any amount I want. I mean, I can go in the software, I mean, on the unit itself and do it at any time, but I can also do it right here. Uh, data logging interval is every one minute. I can set that, that to every 10 minutes, 1,000 minutes, every five minutes, two and a half minutes, whatever I want. Clear the memory if I like. Change the time that the backlight is on. I changed it from the default to 30 seconds because I like it to be on for longer. You can change the contrast of the screen, which is useful too. Some interesting stuff. 
uh, cut on and off auto averaging. Um, if you have auto averaging on, it'll 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 switch between fast and slow averaging uh, depending on count rate, which is useful. Here are the efficiencies that they claim to have for their nucleides. If you are using little point sources like I am, you could actually ca uh, calculate these efficiencies yourself pretty easily and you could uh, put them into these values right here and save and when you did that the unit would then respond exactly the way you want it to. You could make it perfectly match up. So even if even if you disagree and believe they have them wrong, you could still change them yourself. And you could also take something like let's say carbon 14 you don't think you're ever going to use, you could calculate the efficiency for something else. Let's say you have a lot of depression glass. You could calculate the standard efficiency for depleted uranium and depression glass and then put that in here and when you set it to carbon 14 you would know in reality you're, you're actually looking at uh, depression glass. So very, very useful right there. I mean you can also just adjust the, de the, the detector and give it a calibration for something else if you want, but that's more complicated. So not bad. You can adjust even dead time and sensitivity, although you want to be careful adjusting these two values right here unless you really know what you're doing because you can really screw, st screw stuff up if you don't do that. You can also go in here, by the way, and change what it's currently looking at at any given time. All right. Functions. Retrieve memory or synchronize to your actual computer's clock, which is very useful. That way, if you go on a trip or something, you can actually time it to the clock and see where you were and what happened. Retrieve memory. Sure, let's go do that. Now, it's putting off a window that's halfway off screen, and I'm not going to mess with it right this moment, so I'll just leave it where it is. Do, 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 do. And this is going to retrieve the memory of what we've been doing. For example, during the video, you'll see all of that. And I actually, you know, do a lot of outtakes when I do my videos. So you'll see other readings that are on there. Some pretty crazy stuff, too. Almost done. Just about there it is. Now, it actually took me a little while to figure this out. This was not like as apparent to me as you might have thought. Now, the reason you have so many control things like power on and clock set and stuff is because I was fooling around with it so much while I was showing it to you. Normally, you'd only see like a power on at the top, maybe, or a clock set at the top. So let's understand what this says. Ignore these. These are me messing with the unit, showing it to you. All right. At this, let's, let's grab this guy right. Where's a good one? Let's grab this guy right here. What's this line say? Here's the date. Here's the time. This is the beginning of the time. It ended right here. It's a one minute interval, remember? During the minute of 24, we had a total count of 182 counts during that minute. And this is the interval, which is one minute. Now, if the interval was every 10 minutes and you got 182, you divide it by 10 to know that you were at 18.2 counts per second on, I mean, per minute on average. See what I mean? During this one minute period, 10 minute, 30 minute, whatever you set it to, in this case, one minute, during this period, the highest count rate that we got was 294 counts per minute. Now, you might say, how can it be that? Because we didn't actually go over that amount. Well, that's the highest it was set to. Uh, but it was apparently fluctuating because the lowest count rate it hit was 58. It went between the two of them. It probably jumped from here to here, and the net of what it ended up getting was this guy right here. And the period of time, the, the actual moment when it hit this maximum value was 46 seconds into the minute, and when it hit this value at the very beginning of the minute. That's what it was when the minute started. That's what that means. So if that helps you a little bit, it took me a little bit to figure this out, but it's not actually that complicated. Once you get an idea of what it's doing, you can save it and so on. Um, you can synchronize it. You can also uh, go back here and clear the memory, too. So let's clear the memory. Boing. Memory's cleared. Uh, very, very simple. Now, I would like to point out that um, as useful as this tool is, I don't think that it replaces something like Geiger Graph for Mineral Labs, which I think has a lot more functionality in it. But I see them as being not really competitors, but different. This is really a tool that's more used for your inspector, like you're running around outside in the field with it. Um, I wouldn't use this for continual background logging. I would use this for working with the inspector and gathering and looking at your data. Whereas I would use, some, I would use something like uh, Mineral Labs Geiger Graph with RadiationNetwork.com for actual long-term monitoring, which I think is a much uh, better strategy for long-term. So they each have their own roles. All right, so now we've messed with our barium-137M generator. Let's go back now and see it's been over 30 minutes. Let's see whether or not everything is decayed back down to normal. All right, so here we are back with our material, and we can take our inspector, which already has a, a pretty high count rate over in this area, open up the back, and inspect to see whether or not everything's back to normal. 
without touching anything very carefully because we don't want to touch the unit. You can put the unit in a plastic bag if you are actually te te if you are testing something a little bit more contaminated than this. But as you can see, everything has gone pretty much back to normal. And of course, this is a predicted result from barium 137M. And now we know we're probably safe. And also taking something like a heavy um, scintillation counter. Oops, put this in here. And actually test to see whether or not it's safe. Switch that to fast mode. It looks like the scintillator agrees. Which is good, because if it didn't, it would be violating the laws of physics. <laughs> but anyhow, so, the Inspector USB. I, I absolutely think this thing is a dream. Oh, and by the way, to point out something about food testing, this is not a unit for food testing. Uh, for the record, this is not a unit for food testing. Food testing should be done by uh, a gamma spectrometer or a liquid beta spectrometer and requires significant skill, time, and investment. So I would just toss that out there for everyone to know. But very useful to know if your world is otherwise radioactive. Thank you.